In the first episode, we had a lot of hands-on experience with bridge networks and we defined our own bridge, also with Docker Compose. If you haven't seen it, here is a link to the video. Like always, all the commands that I type or show will be in the description of the video. You might ask, why would I want to have other network types than the default bridge network? Fair enough. After all, we can map ports from the Docker host to the bridge network in a container and make it accessible from the physical network. Plus, we have all possibilities of communication between the containers. Well, in fact, there are a handful of limitations or particularities with a bridge network. For example, a Docker container will only be reachable via the IP address of its host. There might be situations where you want the container to appear as a standalone machine in the network with its own IP address. Also, performance could be a reason. Stay tuned. Quick reminder guys, here is the breakdown of this episode. Please use the chapter markers if you're in a hurry and want to fast forward. The chapters are on the timeline and in the description of the video. Thank you. Let's start with the host network. We will use the same container like we did in the first episode. That means the nginx demo slash hello container. Just this time in the network section, we specify the host network. Guys, we're using Portainer for this. See the description on how to install it or check the first episode. Thanks. On the command line, you could specify the network to use with a dash dash network option. Now, moving over to the containers section in Portainer, we can see that the container has been created and that there is no mapped port. However, if I open a new tab in my browser and I browse to the localhost address, then I can see that the Nginx demo container replies on standard HTTP port 80. And it replies with the localhost address 127.001. It gives back the same IP address if I browse to the quadruple zero address. So if I let Linux choose which interface to use or if I use the host name of my Docker host. They all resolve to the localhost address inside the container. If I browse to the LAN IP address of my Docker host, then the container replies with that IP address. Same is true if I browse to the default address of any bridge. It will always reply on that interface. So the first thing which we note when we use the host network is that the container replies on all interfaces of the host. In networking terms, it's bound to the generic 0.0.0.0 address, which means it replies on all interfaces, including the bridges. It's therefore visible not only on this host, but also in the physical network and all containers can see it. In other words, it's pretty much like running Nginx directly on the host without any network bindings and without any isolation. That's definitely something to keep in mind. Next, let's talk about performance. A Docker bridge is nothing else than a NAT or masquerading network. That means very much like your local network at home is isolated from the internet behind your router, the Docker bridge is isolated behind the Docker host. Very much like your router in the LAN, the Docker host serves as a gateway and can forward ports. It also masquerades outgoing packets with its own IP. But this mechanism, NAT or masquerading, uses CPU. Not a big deal on one single container with one user on a powerful PC. But if you have hundreds or thousands of connections or multiple high-speed connections, then you will notice that. Let's check. We add two simple containers, one with a host network and one with a bridge network. Let's call them Ubuntu host and Ubuntu bridge. I'll just use Ubuntu as an image and type in slash bin slash bash as a command and important select interactive and TTY as console type. What I want to do is stress the network a little bit. For this, I will use iperf3. That's just a tool that you can use to measure point-to-point -point network speeds. One side acts as a server and the other side is a client. We will check both directions. iperf3 answers on port 5201, so nothing to do on the host network. But on the bridge network, I will map port 5202 to port 5201 in the container because I can't use the same port twice on my host.
Inside the container I go to the console, run slash bin slash bash and run apt update and apt install iperf3 in order to install the tool. On a distant host I launched an iperf3-s, so that host is my iperf3 server. And from within the container I will now just pump a gigabit stream over to it by doing iperf3-c and the IP address of the server. While I do this I will observe the CPU on my docker host with htop. First the host network. CPU goes roughly from 37 to 50% here. The iperf3 process uses 2% CPU. Now with the bridge network. Hmm, more or less the same. So outgoing masquerading doesn't seem to be very expensive from a compute standpoint. We can't really see the difference. Now let's exchange server and client roles. I start iperf3 in server mode in both containers by typing iperf3-s and now I can connect to my docker host from the distant machine either on port 5201 to the host network or to port 5202 on the bridge network. First the host. That one CPU core here goes roughly to 70 to 75% plus the iperf3 process pulls between 34 and 35 and 40%. Okay. Next with the bridge network. I think that's obvious. Total CPU on that core goes close to 90% while the iperf3 itself pulls constantly above 45%. Again, it doesn't seem to matter really because the machine that I'm running it on is so powerful. But in relative numbers, that's a 15 to 20% uplift in CPU cost, okay? Right, so as we could see, the Docker host network uses fewer CPU resources than the bridge network. It's a question of scale. No problem on one machine, potentially a big deal on a million servers with zillions of users. Another aspect why you would want to choose the host network is if you have applications which use many ports. In the bridge network you would need to expose and map every single one while in the host network all ports would automatically be exposed. Flip side of this might be security considerations. So if you actually don't want ports to be exposed then you have better isolation with a bridge network. Cool. So both network types have their particularities. However, they both have one thing in common. That is, if I want to access a container from outside of the docker host, I would always need to go to the IP address of the docker host. Also, if I wanted to run multiple instances of a container on the same port, I just can't do that because I only have one host. I would need to use a bridge and map different ports to the different instances. Let's have a look at the next network type, the Mac VLAN network. Creating a Mac VLAN network in Portainer is a two-step process. First, we need to configure it and then we can create a network using it. The reason is that Portainer creates the network as a so-called config-only network. I don't really know why. Anyhow, let's configure one. In the network section we click on Add, then we select Mac VLAN as the network type and again give it an address range like we did in the first episode with a bridge. Couple of remarks with regards to that range. If you have a router that gives away addresses over DHCP, then you should exclude that range here in order to avoid duplicate IPs. Very often those are the address ranges from .100 to .200 for example. You should also of course exclude your router's IP address and any other fixed IP address that you have on your LAN. You can do this by defining subnets here. Depending on how many IP addresses you want, you can make this larger or smaller. Alternatively, you could specify a range that is not inside the IP address range of your LAN at all and change it from inside the container later. For example with DHCP. We'll come to that. That is actually what I do here. I specify a range that has nothing to do with my LAN. Next, we do the same thing again, but this time we actually create the network. We select the Mac VLAN network, which we have added before. That actually creates a usable network. On the command line, we could have done this in one step by issuing a docker network create command with a D option Mac VLAN 
and the O option parent equals Ethernet 0, for example. Now let's again define a container. Add container, give it a name, use Ubuntu as an image, same parameters as before for command and console. In the network section, let's first use a bridge. We will attach the Mac VLAN later, but I want to show you something. To make a start, however, we need an interface with internet access in order to pull some software. Next, go over to the capabilities here and let's add the net underscore admin capability to the container. It will all become clear in a minute. We deploy the container and launch a console. First, we need some additional software in the container. Therefore, let's do apt update, then apt install IP route 2 and dhcp cd5 and IP utils ping. Now we go back to the container properties, scroll all the way down to the networks, we leave the bridge network and we join the Mac VLAN network. Back to the console. If I type ip-br-addr, I can see the IP address of the new network. But as I had given it an address outside of my LAN space, I can't access the internet or anything. I first need an address in the LAN, which I can pull from my router using DHCP with DHCP CD. So I type DHCP CD Ethernet 1 and ta-da! I get assigned an IP address by my router. And that only works because I had added the net underscore admin capability. With this capability and with the IP route 2 package, I can now release the unused address by doing IP address del, then the address, def, and here the network interface. Checking with IP-BR-ADDR shows the magic. I now only have that IP address in my LAN, which I got over DHCP. Let's try and ping Google. Yep, that works. Nice. Okay, let's stop here for a second. We have done a lot of things here. We have added a Mac VLAN config only network to Docker. We then defined a network using that config. Then we created a container on a bridge network, pulled some software, and after that we left the bridge network and joined the Mac VLAN network. We then requested an IP address over DHCP from my router in the LAN, deleted the old IP address, and we can now browse to my router status page and here we see that the Docker container is listed very much like any other PC or device or VM or container. You couldn't really tell from the outside that it's actually a Docker container. When I defined the network, I could of course have added an IP address range from my LAN directly. And that would have saved us the additional steps of first adding the bridge for internet connection in order to install the software we needed and second join the Mac VLAN network separately. But I wanted to show you two more things here. First, you can leave or join networks with a Docker container. And second, if you add the net underscore admin capability, then you can change the network configuration from inside the container. That may come in handy if you want to create containers that actually behave like a physical machine in your network, such as routers. If you have followed the previous episodes, then you might see where this is going. Right? Just a quick remark on the MAC address flow. I had not specified a MAC address for that interface. So when I stop and restart the container, I might get a new one. And hence, if I launch DHCP CD again, I might get a different IP address and also the old address might remain blocked on the router until the end of the lease. So it would be safer to actually define a MAC address on the container's network definition. Another thing to know is that if you run Docker in a virtual machine, then you would need to define the network adapter such that they support promiscuous mode. That means 
the network adapter needs to be able to have multiple MAC addresses. So that might be one thing to check if the previous steps didn't work for you. Perfect. So if you have watched both episodes so far, then you should now have a good overview of networking options in Docker from the system bridge to user-defined bridges to the host and Mac VLAN network drivers. We have spoken about Docker Compose files in order to have bridges defined for stacks. We had a brief look at Docker integration into editors such as Visual Studio Code. And we can now define containers that behave like physical machines inside our LAN. The only limitation so far is that we have done everything on one single Docker host. In one of the next episodes, we might again take this to the next level by defining a Docker swarm made of two or more hosts and define an overlay and ingress network in order to be able to scale workloads over multiple hosts. Let me know in the comment section if you're interested. Awesome! Again, I hope that I could give you some ideas to experiment with. We might follow up with having a look at how we can import a, a disk image of a virtual machine into a Docker container so that we can, for example, run OpenWRT in a container and build a Dockerized version of our test lab network. Or we might have a look at Docker Swarms or maybe have a closer look at Docker Compose or Visual Studio Code and stuff like Git maybe. Leave me a comment. Until then, many thanks for watching, liking, commenting and subscribing. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye for now.